We left off talking about some human genetic disorders, and I'd like to finish off now the, our treatment of transmission genetics, that is the inheritance of traits passed on from one generation to the next, before moving on to the information flow that occurs within cells, the coding of information in DNA and the decoding of that information into gene function. So let's finish off our treatment of transmission genetics by considering two, uh, two additional um, phenomena, cytoplasmic inheritance and genomic imprinting. So first let's, let's cover cytoplasmic inheritance. And so you'll remember when our treatment of the evolution of gender, uh, we talked about the uniparental inheritance of mitochondria and mito in animals and mitochondria and chloroplasts in plants. So we have a nuclear genome in an egg that is 1N and we have a nuclear genome in sperm or pollen if you're a plant that is also 1N and these unite in fertilization to form the 2N zygote. But that considers only the nuclear genes. Um, now we need to consider the organelle DNA that is present in mitochondria in animals and mitochondria and chloroplasts if you are a plant. And we talked about the virtual uniparental inheritance of these organelles in the zygote due to the fact that sperm uh, contribute virtually no um, organelles to the zygote. Therefore, in terms of the mitochondrial or chloroplast genomes in zygotes, those genomes are strictly inherited through the cytoplasm of the egg and therefore are maternally inherited. And therefore, if there are mutations in the circular DNA of a mitochondrion, let's say, so if we blow up a mitochondrion and we know that each mitochondrion has an outer membrane and a highly folded inner membrane, but in, within that mitochondrion, there are um, circular DNA molecules, anywhere from 10 to 20, say, circular DNA molecules that compose the mitochondrial genome. So if this is a mitochondrion, then we have mitochondrial DNA, or mDNA, mitochondrial DNA equals mDNA, present in the mitochondria. And that DNA, as we've just pointed out, is strictly inherited through the maternal line, through, through egg cytoplasm. And therefore, if mutations in DNA are present, uh, in mitochondrial DNA are present in uh, mitochondria within the egg, those are passed on to offspring through the mother, through the mother exclusively. And so what we have here then is maternal inheritance of mitochondrial mDNA or chloroplast DNA if you're talking about a plant. And this type of inheritance would not, would not follow Mendelian rules, of course, because we're not talking about the nuclear genes that were described by Mendel, and what we've, and those are the genes we've considered so far in terms of, of our transmission genetics that we've covered. Instead, we have cytoplasmic inheritance of traits through mitochondria or chloroplasts only through the maternal line. So that, that is something to consider. Now, what about genomic imprinting and um, epigenetics. So it, it turns out that let's look at a, at a hypothetical cross that uh, would have been one of the types of experiments that allowed the discovery of genomic imprinting. So I'm going to go through the experiment first and then we'll interpret it in terms of genomic imprinting. So if we have a case where there is, now we're back to nuclear genes, we're not doing cytoplasmic genes anymore, we're not doing uh, mitochondria or chloroplast genes, so we're talking about nuclear genes. So let's imagine the case where we have a wild type over wild type female with respect to a particular gene. We'll call this gene a gene of interest, G-O-I, means gene of interest. And that female is crossed to a male that is heterozygous for a mutation, a particular mutation. Well then we know what our ratio of genotypes in the offspring will be. We know that one half of the offspring will be homozygous for the wild type allele, and one half of the offspring will be heterozygous for um, the alleles, for the mutant allele and the wild type allele. And let's imagine in this case 
that we have a wild type phenotype indicated by quotation marks here for the homozygous wild type. And we also have a wild type phenotype in the case of the heterozygote. So we say that the wild type allele in this case is dominant to the mutant allele. That is, we don't have a mutant phenotype. Well, let's talk about this same gene of interest over here, but let's do the reciprocal cross. Let's cross a heterozygous female, a female that's heterozygous for the same mutation that we're talking about over here, and let's cross her to a homozygous wild type male. I forgot to put my male sign over here, so I will. So now we're going to end up with the two same genotypes here. One half of the offspring will be homozygous for wild type. They'll inherit the wild type allele from their mother, the wild type allele from their father, and one half will be wild type over mutant. In this case, this genotype will have inherited the mutant allele from their mother and the wild type allele from the father. Well, here we will have a wild type phenotype, but here, we have a mutant phenotype. That is very strange. That's an odd result. Here we have the exact same genotype that differs in terms of the mutant phenotype. And the, um, this type of genetic experiment in mice led to this discovery of something we call genomic imprinting. It turns out that uh, males and or female, males and females both inactivate certain genes, not by mutation, but by, but by um, modifying the DNA in such a way that, you know, that we call an epigenetic phenomenon. This introduces the phenomenon of epigenetics. Epi means upon, genetics means genetics. So we're talking about changes in the genome that are not due to sequence changes of the DNA, that is, do not cause the, the production of mutant gene products, but rather silence genes by modifying the way that DNA is packaged. So we, this affects DNA packaging. And also modification of DNA by DNA methylation, by sticking methyl groups on the DNA, which silences genes. So in the case that we've just considered here, what is happening is that the male here has silenced particular genes in the sperm. So we have, this, we have a sperm fertilizing an egg in both of these cases. Here the sperm was contributing a wild type allele exclusively, and the egg was contributing a mutant allele for this particular genotype here. But what if the male had packaged the wild type allele that was being brought to this zygote, and packaged it in such a way that in the embryo it would be silenced? Well, then we would have a mutant over wild type genotype. But this, in this, we have a gene of interest that is inactive. We'll indicate that with an I. The gene of interest is inactive. And in the zygote, that this is inactive, and therefore, we have a mutant allele that was contributed by the mother, and the father has contributed an allele that, although wild type in sequence, although a normal gene has been packaged or modified in such a way that it is silenced in the 2N zygote. So here's our nucleus of the, of the zygote, and that wild type allele has been rendered inactive by modifications that have occurred in the male germline when he was constructing um, in his testis, he was constructing the sperm, that gene was, that particular allele that we're talking about, the wild type allele, was silenced by packaging the DNA tightly um, or by methylating the DNA in such a way that the gene would be inactive. And likewise, over, or, or contrary-wise, I should say, over here, what has happened is we have the same genotype. We have, in this case, the male is bringing in, let's say for this genotype, here, the male is bringing in the mutant allele, and the egg is bringing in the wild type allele. So we have fusion event here that leads to a mutant over wild type genotype. But the mutant allele has come in from the male, and the female in this case has not silenced that allele. That is, it is still active. So here, our gene of interest is active. The, the 
the female has not silenced or packaged that gene in an epigenetic fashion that renders it inactive. Rather, it is active. So when we have a wild type allele that functions normally, then this will produce a wild type phenotype. But here we have a wild type allele that is inactive. And since that is over a mutant allele, we end up with then a mutant phenotype. So here we have the phenomenon of what that we call genomic imprinting. This is called genomic imprinting. And for this particular gene of interest that we've been considering, the, the gene that is inactivated is inactivated in the male germline and is inactive in the embryo that is formed, the zygote that is formed. And in the, over here, the female does not inactivate that gene. But there are genes that are inactivated in the female germline and not the male. There's the reciprocal situation. And in that case, of course, we would have the reciprocal sit situation. So if the uh, female was inactivating a particular allele, then um, we would have a mutant phenotype in, in this, gene this genotype would, in would produce a mutant phenotype. And over here, this genotype would produce a non-mutant or wild-type phenotype because the wild-type allele is being inactivated in the female. So this phenomenon of epigenetics was a big surprise and really did seem to contradict standard Mendelian genetics. And in a way it does because it's, it's, it's above, it's, it represents changes in the epigenetic state of DNA, not in the sequence of DNA. So we're not changing alleles per se, we're changing how those alleles are expressed in an embryo. And, that, and only a certain subclass of genes are affected by this phenomenon in the female germline and in the male germline. And that leads to certain human uh, disorders. So to look at, at uh, a couple of these disorders, um, let's look at the effect of genomic imprinting that is revealed to us by a partial deletion of chromosome 15. So when we speak of a deletion, a chromosomal deletion, we're talking about a a defective chromosome that is missing some genes. It's actually those genes have been deleted and are gone. Well, if that deletion chromosome, which is missing genes, certain genes of chromosome 15, is uh, contributed by the father to offspring, then we end up with something called prater willi syndrome. And the reason that this disorder exists is because the female has inactivated genes in the chromosome that she has contributed. And since the male is passing on the chromosome 15 that is missing that gene, then we end up with a mutant phenotype, uh, the prater willi syndrome. And it's, um, this has uh, certain uh, effects on the embryo, certain disorders, uh, including mental retardation. On the other hand, if that same chromosome 15 with the deletion is passed on to offspring through the mother, then the male has inactivated there are other genes in, through genomic imprinting in the uh, chromosomes that he is contributing through the sperm. And we end up with Engelmann syndrome, which is different than Prader-Willi syndrome. So these are two different genetic disorders caused by the genomic imprinting of different genes in the male and in the female. And those, that, those genes that are silenced by epigenetic means, by DNA packaging and DNA methylation in male and female chromosomes that are contributed to the zygote. It, those, that genomic imprinting is revealed to us because of a deletion, small deletion in chromosome 15 that shows, that allows for the genomic imprinting to be detected. So genomic imprinting is a um, fantastically interesting genetic phenomenon and it's also um, also reveals to us some human genetic disorders that are caused by this type of um, modification of DNA. And again, I want to stress that here, we are, when we talk about epigenetic silencing of genes, we are not talking about changing the gene sequences in any particular way that renders an allele inactive. Rather, we're talking about the way that the alleles are packaged or modified by, um, by enzymes that will methylate uh, particular genes. So that is the phenomenon of, of genetic, of um, genomic imprinting. And now we're ready to leave our treatment of transmission genetics
and progress to the transmission of information within cells that uh, involves the encoding of genetic information in DNA and the decoding of that information uh, into functional gene products. So that is we're leaving transmission genetics and moving into molecular genetics, which is, does not concern information flow between generations, but rather information flow within cells. And that's where we'll pick up with in the next part of this lecture. <laughs>